All right, so welcome to Math 344, Math of Sports. This is lecture three. And so what I want to do today is start talking about comparing statistics. So we're gonna talk about uh, various statistics that we can use to measure the same item. And so this will be the card problem that I gave you. And so I just you know, brought some of the cards over here from winter study that I did. So you can take a look at them if you're interested after class. And then this is going to then segue into what you were doing for your homework is emailing me what statistics to study. And I'll end with you know, some presentation topics. And this is just a subset of things that we can talk about. So I, I just did a little Google to try to find your most expensive cards. I am shocked that this one is coming up at almost $2 million, the 1968 you know, Topps uh, Nolan Ryan rookie card. He's a great player and everything, but you know, Two million seems a little bit absurd for this one, but it's interesting to think of how much certain cards are worth. What do you think might control the value of a card? Yes. Condition. Condition. You know, it's not a coincidence that these cards are all being sent in you know, some kind of container that protects them. What else? How old they are. How old they are. What else? How rare. How rare. You, know, you could have an old card that's in great condition, but there might be a lot of them. If you know, somehow there's only a very small number, if you collect stamps, if there's a small number of stamps where you, the airplane is printed upside down. You know, this is one of the ultimate collector items. So the question is to try to figure out how do we want to order these cards? So it goes from a 59, a 64 Yogi Berra, one as a player, one as a manager, all the way down to Tom Brady, who just finally, I think has said he's done playing again. Which card of a player do you think is the most valuable card for the player? 59 Yogi Bear. Well, no, no, in general, for any player, for any player. Which, which of their cards? Oh, rookie, cards. rookie cards. Or sometimes the pre-rookie card. They sometimes have you know, the prospect cards. So an earlier Tom Brady or rookie Tom Brady should be worth more than a later one. And so we have a bunch of cards here. And the question is, rank them. You know, which one do you think is the most expensive? Which one do you think is the least expensive? And so here are the solutions. So the uh, 1959 Yogi Berra player was about $86. The 64 was 69. The Michael Jordan, 49. The Gretzky, 14. The Tom Brady, 28. And so on and so on and so on. And so the next is you know, what you guys did. And so you know, it doesn't matter who did what. So this is, means this person thought the 59 Yogi was the most valuable, the 64 Yogi the second, the 91 Jordan the third. They thought the 80, the 19, I was like the 2018 Messi was the fourth and so on and so on. I don't really care who did what. I don't really care how well people did. What I wanna do is I wanna answer the question, who did the best? In most things, how many of you have played a team sport? What's the only statistic that matters at the end of the day? Winning, right? Everything else does not matter. We scored more yards. We, we had more yards on offense than the other team. Okay, who scored more points, right? You know, all that matters at the end of the day for a lot of sports is who won. Now, when you're trying to assemble a team, Yes, these statistics are extremely important. They help us assemble the team. But at the end of the day, we care about winning games. Well, this is a harder problem. How do we determine who did best? So can somebody give me one possible statistic? And it could be influenced by how you chose to view things. So the number in the first row, one, two, three, five, four, is the order of your value of the card. So can somebody give me a statistic to determine who did the best job in the ranking? Yes. I don't know exactly how to word it, but uh, I could take the difference between, like the, like the square difference between how far apart they all are. Good. So what you can do is you can, this is the Euclidean metric. I can look and see how far is my vector from the ranking vector. Now that treats all cards equally. Do we want to treat all cards equally? 
Which cards are more important? You could probably make the argument that the first couple, first three, the most expensive ones. Right? Yeah, so maybe the more expensive ones are more valuable. So maybe instead of, maybe we might want to weight things a little bit by how valuable the cards are. And you know, if you have basically everything off by one, but you have the Yogi Berra listed as the least valuable card, that might be a tremendous error. So you might want to have something like that. Be very careful with how you answer the next question. If you answer this wrong, you will fail the class. New York in general and Manhattan in specific does something better than Boston. As a Bostonian, I have to tip my hat to this. What does Manhattan do well? In what sense? There's something that Manhattan does well. And when you compare that to Boston, it's night and day. Who's familiar with Manhattan? How would you describe Manhattan? Uh, it's, set up like grid. it's set up like a grid. We often talk about the, you know, you can only move north, south, east, west. Boston, you can have your know, beacon and calm have cross each other as to which street is above the other, they switch. You know, it's a nightmare getting around in Boston. Manhattan has a great grid system. You gave me the Euclidean metric. I could actually use the absolute value metric. I could do something like that as well. And so when you use the Euclidean metric, uh, if you've done linear regression, this is the method of least squares. How many of you have done regression? All right, so I think every hand is up. So everyone has done regression. So we use sums of squares because now the tools of calculus and linear algebra are available. The square function is differentiable. The absolute value function is not. But we could, you know, for our metric, we could look at the absolute value of the difference of each one, not the square. And the advantage of that now is if you get something wrong and it's a big mistake, you're not gonna be enormously penalized for that. Can anybody give me another metric we can use? I've got a few more that I came up with. So we're trying to see who did the best. What else could you use? Yes. You could like add points for getting something in the correct spot. Okay, good. So maybe everything that's in a correct spot is worth a point. Or you could have a certain number of points for the correct spot, maybe then a number less, but some points if it's only off by one. Other things you could do is you could just say, how many right do you have in a row? You know, starting at the beginning. So as soon as you make a mistake, you're then out of it. But you could see how many right do you have from the beginning? So let me move on to the next page. So I wrote down six possible statistics. One is looking at sum of squares. One is looking at the sum of the absolute values. Um, another one is looking at just the number wrong that I got. Another one is 10 minus the number of consecutive that I got right starting from the beginning. Another one is the absolute uh, weight times you know, the price so that the more expensive card, you know, getting that wrong costs you more. And then the last one is this geometric weight. So um, I chose 1.618033989. Anybody have any idea why I chose that as my weight? I know what it is. Okay. Why. Okay. Well, what is it? It's, the it's the golden ratio. So basically, the, the, the most valuable card I gave a rate of one. The next card was a rate of one over the golden mean. The next one was one over the golden mean squared. So the deeper you get, the less I really care about you know, how much you got it. Depending on what value you choose for the weight, you can greatly impact how much things you know, change. One of the things we've talked a little bit about is you wanna be able to compare numbers. And so I've adjusted all of these so that the lower number is better than the high number. That's why I'm looking at 10 minus the number of consecutive rather than just how many consecutive right did you get? So no matter what I look at, whatever is smaller is better. 
So I highlighted in yellow for each category who was best. And then I highlighted, what do you want to call that? Peachish orange? Whoever was second best. What do you notice from this? Again, it's tough because it's a small data set. Um, one person was the best in both metrics. In almost every metric, whoever was number two, and I do know who number two was, you know, kicked ass. Right? Really doesn't matter what I'm looking at, except for 10 minus the number of consecutive, they were the best there. And if you look at 10 minus the number of consecutive, they just missed by one. It's really nice when you have something that has this level of stability that as I change the metrics I'm looking at, I don't get wildly different orders. So it doesn't really matter if I use this or that or something else, I'm getting roughly the same thing. So maybe these statistics are somewhat comparable. If you've taken some advanced math classes, you might have talked about topology and you could use open disks, you can use circles. You could also use diamonds, you could use squares. They're gonna generate the same type of behavior. Sometimes one is more convenient to use than another. It's nice here that these seem to be pretty similar and that the relative rankings seem to be pretty consistent. There were two people who did very well with sums of squares and sums of absolute values and not as well with the other stuff. And then there was one person who did you know, pretty well across the board with all the metrics, um, not so well with the sum of squares. And again, there's a huge penalty you know, with the sum of squares. And again, you really want to think about what metric do you choose and how does that influence what you do? A lot of times teams focus on bad statistics, but because people think that those statistics have value, you try to assemble people and people play for those statistics. So I really want you to be thinking about this as we start to go to presentations, as we start to analyze, does the statistic measure what we want it to measure? Is it a good statistic, is it, easily to is it easy to compute? All of these are easy to compute. The hardest one here is choosing this geometric weight. Why the golden mean versus something else? So we had a really nice discussion with people emailing about some of the statistics they wanted to look at. We're, and now we put in these you know, factors that come from you know, regression, God, whatever, in terms of how we care about the different things. All right, so. Um, so some statistics brought up in class. I'll talk a little bit about some of these. So clutch time. So uh, NBA, where two conditions are met, it's during the final five minutes of a game and the score differential is five or lower. And so this is supposed to see how valuable plays and strategies are when there's at least you know, room for error. So if you're up by a large amount, you're willing to give up points in exchange for the clock being eaten up. So the Eagles are about to go to their third Super Bowl or fourth? Raiders pass, pass. Oh, that's right, the Raiders, forgot the Raiders. Yes. When the Eagles played the Patriots, it was amazing at the end of the game. I think the Patriots were up by around 10 points and the Eagles were running instead of the, you know, no huddle offense, they were basically running the casual, you know, take your time offense. I just knew as a Patriots fan, like, if you're willing to take this much time to run your plays, we will give you the field to slowly march down. It was almost like they were drinking tea. We couldn't believe how much time they were taking. And the Patriots were quite willing to give them, sure, march down the field at this rate. We just don't want to give you the quick score. So for something like this, if the game's got to be close enough so that it really matters. You know, five points in basketball can evaporate very quickly. You score three pointers, steal the ball, that's it. And so what, uh, what is exactly being measured in clutch time? Well, you're just looking at the statistics from this part of the game and not looking at the statistics from elsewhere. So just how is the team playing in these key minutes? And again, this is similar to a lot of sports where you can just run out the clock. Okay, expected goals and expected assists in soccer. And so uh, it's the probability that a shot will result in a goal based on the characteristics of that shot 
and the events leading up to it. And so everything falls between zero, a definite miss, and one, a definite goal. And here's the key phrase, using a large sample size of shots with similar characteristics to determine the probability of a goal. That's a wonderful phrase. It's telling us where we're getting these values from. We're looking at leads and we're looking at what happens and we're using that. There's something very similar to this in baseball. Uh, how many of you, who are my baseball players here? Or baseball fans? All right, the run expectancy matrix. So in baseball, there are three bases, first, second, and third. Each base can be empty or have a runner. So how many possible states are there for runners on base? So three bases, each base could have a player or not. So how many states? Eight. And then there could be zero, one, or two outs. So there's 24 game states. And for each game state, you can calculate what is the expected number of runs that will be scored from that position. So, you know, which is the best configuration? Bases loaded, no outs? Or might something be better? Maybe second and third, no outs? Maybe, right, like, because it takes away the double play. So it's an interesting question that it might actually be better not to have that runner on first because that opens up the possibility of a double play. And so in baseball, if the batter doesn't get to first base successfully, the run doesn't count. So second and third, one out might be a little bit better than bases loaded and one out because of the possibility of the double play. It may not be, but it's at least conceivable. So they can look at data for hundreds, thousands of games and create this, you know, there's been 15,283 configurations where this has happened. And this is what we expect will happen. Over here, it's the same thing in soccer. You're looking at the shots, trying to get a sense. So let's talk about this. Is this a good statistic? Is it a bad statistic? Is it easy to use? Is it easy to compute? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think uh, it, seems, it seems like it gets harder, harder to compute the more element that you take into it, like specifically like the location of the shooter, like if you're uh, depending on yeah. what perspective you're looking at it from. I don't know if you like like from the perspective that you're like an actual sports analyst and you're at the game versus like you're outside and you're trying to look on right. a specific website. It doesn't always list like the location the shooter was at and stuff like that. So you have to fine tune it a bit more. But just generally, uh, when you fine tune it, you have less data to work with, but you could like have. Uh, right, the, the, the larger the clumps that you consider equivalent, <laughs> the more data you'll have. But then, of course, things are going to be averaged out. And so a lot of times now with computers, you can actually scan the entire field. You can really record where everybody was and have very accurate data on where somebody was when they shot. But of course, it also matters where the defense is. So when you're trying to look like this, uh, it's not just you know, where are you shooting, but you know, what is the defensive configuration at that moment? And by what play in particular does that include? The goalie. And so you know, if the goalie has been drawn one way, and now you've got a quick you know, pass across to the other side, very different than if you just initially started there. So how much do we put into something like this? There's a lot of things which in principle are wonderful statistics. The question is, can we gather enough data to actually make it useful? And you know, again, with enough data, with enough sensors, you can record everything you want. But then you wonder, do I have enough data points for it to be meaningful? One of the things I truly hate in baseball is they say, oh, you know, this is a favorable matchup for the batter. You know, he's three for five against this pitcher in your know, playoff games on. Uh, weekdays, you know, before 5 p.m. on days following a full moon. I once heard a statistic, you know, about the Patriots, you know, do very well against the Jets in modern era years of presidential elections going to Republican candidates. Like, we're talking about maybe two or three data points separated by multiple, I mean, it's, you, you wonder at times the statistics people come up with. 
The danger is if you divide things up into too small a category and you want to put in these values, where are you getting these values from? You know, where did I choose the golden mean from? I, I like the golden mean. It occurs in a lot of things in nature. Why not just put it there? But over here, we need to have a way of assigning a probability between zero and one. That's nice. It's a very good skill to look at this. But I worry, do we have enough data to make a good value assessment for something like this? OK, so next was your course E for hockey. Um, and it measures a team shot attempts for um, all shots and goal shot attempts that missed the net and shots that were blocked. Uh, measures a team's shot attempts against at even strength. OK, so this is not looking at what happens if you're on a power play. And again, if you're on a power play and the other team is down a player. Um, now, when it says even strength, what if both teams have a person in the penalty box? Is that considered even strength? That, that would be considered even strength for this? But it would be very different. And again, you can ask, you know, how often do we have both teams you know, down the same number of players? But you know, it's something to look at. And so again, we're looking at you know, CF divided by CF plus CA. So again, this is another very natural thing to look at. It's going to assign a number between zero and one. So we're seeing a lot of statistics are giving us nice values between zero and one. It's not a surprise that we're seeing things like this. It's something that's going to have an intrinsic value. Uh, putting statistics from golf. So if you shoot exactly par, typically you have about two putts per hole. And so uh, this is looking at what the first putt length and putts per hole are related. Um, a small average first putt is going to, I mean, a small average first putt length. Does that mean that you ended up closer to the hole when you got there? Okay. Because it could be, you know, again, a lot of it's going to be a function of you know, how good is your game to get to the hole? You know, are you able to get to the green, to a good spot in the green, or are you just barely on the edge? Um, and again, what's nice about this is this is going to be you know, a nice integer number. Um, you know, you're not going to have it you know, too high at the professional levels. Uh, volleyball, number of kills uh, subtracted by the number of errors. Uh, this number is then divided by the total number of hitting attempts. Of course, receiving error simply adds the number of shanked passes where a second person cannot touch the volleyball. Uh, we, we start serve receive with more detail than statisticians can to get a better understanding of how well we pass off a serve and set up the next play. So when I see this statistic, which is the first thing that I'm concerned about in terms of evaluating and calculating this? Which word? So I think it's a good statistic, but there's just one word that concerns me. It's calculated as the number of kills subtracted by the number of errors. What's an error? Who determines what an error is? And so in baseball, you have to be good enough, and I know baseball better in terms of statistics. Than, in baseball, you have to be good enough to get close enough to the play to be given an error. If you know we're near, then there's no error. And so a lot of times when you have subjective statistics like this, well, who's the scorer and how are they determining what's an error and what's not an error? The hope is that a lot of things cancel out. You know, in football, you can have the quarterback throw a perfect pass, hits the guy in the numbers and they drop the ball. And that's counted as an incomplete pass and it hurts the quarterback. You also have, um, Oh, I'm blanking. Played for the Giants receiver. Is it Odell? Where he just has this incredible diving catch, one handed, just reaching out. It's almost like Elastic Man, scratches and grabs the ball and brings it in for a catch. And that's counted as a completed pass for the quarterback, just without anything special. And so the hope is that if you have enough plays going on, these things will average out. When you have small numbers of plays, things can be extremely misleading and have a huge impact. 
But over a long season, the hope is that these will average out. And the hope is that, well, we might have some issues with how we're calling errors, but it's hopefully going to go both ways, or it'll be systemic across all plays and all teams, and that it really won't be anything too bad. Uh, time of possession. So this is an interesting set for soccer, also for football. Um, and so in football, it's often tiring to be on the defense. And so if you can keep certain teams off the field and keep the offenses off the field, that's often extremely valuable. Um, for soccer, when you're doing time of possession, does that mean basically you control the ball in their half of the field? Okay, so you can be controlling the ball in your half of the field as well. And so it's just at every moment, which team is controlling the ball? So, so if you are controlling the ball, but you're deep in your own territory, this is very dangerous. But you're also controlling the ball. But you're also controlling the ball. I mean, I would much rather be controlling the ball down there. But so I'm saying the minutes are not the same. So this is a statistic that I think could easily be refined. And you could split it to time of possession in their half, time of possession in our half. Okay, uh, strokes gained in golf. You know, this was uh, you know, a longer your description. I'm going to not say too much about this one right now. Uh, we talked a little bit, or I gave you the paper to read, you know, average cent upon loss from chess. And again, this brings up something that we you know, really need to discuss in this. What is a sport? So this is the mathematics of sport. I don't mean sport as in making fun of someone. You know, what is your definition of a sport? I feel like it has to be some sort of uh, advanced competitive activity. I, I don't want to just say competitive activity and then people are talking about like tag as a sport. I right. Sort of so I mean, to some extent, it's, I know it when I see it. So you want some notion of competitive. Does it have to be direct competitive? So here's my question. Um, I can get into a lot of trouble with this because this is being recorded. Figure skating and gymnastics, my daughter does both. Are these sports? Is there direct competition in skating? Yes, I can judge each other. Right, but does the other person, do their performance affect your performance? So who says there's no direct competition in skating? That what you do is independent of what someone else does? So should that be considered a sport as opposed to just, there is, depending on how you're willing to look at it, interactions between skaters. So how can one skater's performance affect someone else? Well, you see the person before you get some certain score, you might adjust your routine. Excellent. So you can adjust your routine based on what other people are doing. And if you see that someone, oh my God, they just did all of those. I've got to up my game. I got to put something in that I wasn't going to do originally. I've got to get some extra points. Or if you see, oh, I'm the last person to go and everybody else fell on their asses. All I have to do is not make a mistake. I can take away some of my more risky things. So I would actually say skating would fall under direct competition because you can adjust what you're doing based on someone else. I would say the same would be true for gymnastics. What about cycling? Is that a sport? Yeah, I mean, I'd say the same as running. You know, depending on where you are, you can be cutting in front of somebody, and then that's you know the pain of being the first and breaking for someone else. And in cycling, they have your know, teams where people will tire themselves out riding in front, and you're breaking in. Okay, tag. Do we want to consider tag a sport? You're running around, you're doing physical. So does there have to be a physical component? Well, they have a uh, big team tag competition. Like team, like world championship. World championship team tag. Yeah. So I guess all the tag my kids and I played at the start of the pandemic 
could have been training us. Excellent. <laughs> Yes. They also have like competitive one-on-one -on -one tag where people are like running through obstacle courses and doing like parkour and stuff. Yeah. I just when it's one-on-one, -on -one, um, are both people it or? It's like the person who's it has ten, like fifty okay, seconds to, to try and tag the other person, and you have to make it without getting. Got it. But so does there have to be a physical component? You, know, if we played Madden football, would that count as a sport? You know, video gaming, is this a sport? Yes. I mean, like in high school, I go to some video game tournaments for Super Smash Bros. So yes. I'd be biased, but like right. I'd say, uh, you know, absolutely. Like they got sponsors with yes. big companies. They spend hundreds of hours training. Like they, you know, review film. Like it, it, they yes. do the same routines. So. Absolutely. I was terrible at the tournaments. I never did any of that. But like there are people who do. But, 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 but do, you want, do you want to consider video gaming a sport? Yes. I think it's like a, I get it. Like I think it's just right. Like yep. Definition. Yes. I think it's like a slippery slope. Then all right. Well, what else? Well, the, well, the, this is the whole problem with the slippery slope is that to go from A to B is no big deal. To go from B to C is no big deal. And then all of a sudden you're at this point and we're considering tic tac toe a sport <laughs> because it's two people direct competition. You know, rock paper scissors lizard spark. That's okay. But tic-tac-toe, we got to draw the line somewhere. And four lines and that configuration. So it's, you know, it's really something you have to decide. There's no real right answer. Unlike the dispute my family had, which actually split us uh, in the middle during the pandemic, is a hot dog a sandwich. Who says a hot dog is a sandwich out of curiosity? One, two, three. Who says a hot dog is not a sandwich? Yeah. My, my son and I both agreed, you know, hot dog is not a sandwich. You know, it's got to be just connected pieces of bread. So if you then cut the hot dog roll in half, and does that then make it a sandwich? Is a meatball sub a sandwich? You know, and again, this is potentially a silly conversation to be having in a 300 level math class. Right, you know, I should be proving theorems with epsilons. No, we have to decide what we want to study. And you're too often people just start going through warp speed and you don't spend that time in the beginning to think, well, what is going to be the universe of discourse for what we're studying? What do we want this to apply to? If we're studying things of sports, we might say, look, we are not going to try to define sports in general. We're going to try to define sports that we will study in this class. So we'll define the 344 sport. So does there have to be some type of direct competition? So would figure skating and gymnastics count? In swimming, you know, you have people in different lanes. Uh, is there anybody here who ever swam professionally? I actually do know an Olympic swimmer uh, in Williamstown, so I could ask her later. Uh, how much can you see who's around you as to how that will cha you know, change your game? A little bit. And again, for these things, we're not talking about huge amounts of time. Do we want there to be an extreme component of direct interaction between the two sides? Do we want that to be part of our definition of what is a sport? And the answer could be no, it's your, it's your class. So your gymnastics and skating, it's far more indirect. Does there have to be a physical component? Does chess come into play as a sport? So who here has played, who here has golfed? Okay, so I can say at least once in my life, I made a 50 foot putt and I have at least one par on Taconic. I don't think I can say that much more good things about my golf, but at least I have those two. You know, you really need three things. Do we feel that golf is a sport? Do you have to walk the course or can you take a golf cart? What if you're playing competitively? Who is the final arbiter for the rules of golf? It would be like the other people you're playing with, like in mini golf. I know, like oh, I'm talking. I'm like, talking the high, uh, the high level, the high level. With the PGA. Nope. Above the PGA is. 
Who's the final arbiter? Not God, a little bit lower. <laughs> Congress. There was the famous golf case where one of Tiger Woods' friends had issues walking and he wanted to use a golf cart. And so the question was, are you allowed to use a golf cart? You know, the PGA rules at the time were you had to walk the course. And the question is, is it a fundamental part of the game to walk the course or not? And you know, some of the professional golfers said, look, you know, when you're walking for several days on these long courses, it's tiring. And there is, so I mean, one possibility is to say, well, look, everybody can now use a golf cart. We really don't think the key part of golf is the walking. You know, it's the hitting. And so just from this point onward, everybody can use a golf cart. That's one possible solution. But they said, no, we're gonna fight this. And it went all the way to the US Supreme Court and you know, the, you got to be very careful what you talk about. I think this is a controversial topic that you can discuss without getting canceled on campus or into trouble as to where do you stand on golf carts. And this is something that hopefully breaks down the liberal conservative split as to you know, how will people view golf carts in a professional sports environment. And there were some great arguments as to whether or not the American with Disabilities Act applies here or not. You know, how far do you want to go? Well, he's taller than I am in basketball, so I'd need to use a little step ladder for the jump ball to, you know, how far are you willing to go? At what point is something truly fundamental and who sets it? So these are questions you really want to be thinking about. Do we want to consider chess a sport for this class? What do people think? And it could be, no, chess is not a sport. I'll take chess, but I don't want to get to video games. You know, I want to draw the line somewhere. Is chess a sport? Yes. Uh, I, feel like, I feel like chess would be a sport simply because of the amount of, like, uh, I feel like one, there's a certain level of, like, respect and, like, public like discourse about it, mm -hmm. it's a sport like it has, uh, like you were talking about before, you talked about like sponsorships and like coordinated uh, events. Like I feel like together for some reason. So I actually have at home a Bobby Fischer rookie card, and I have no, they, they don't make chess cards. So it's an interesting question as to where is the conversation happening. You're not going to get your tops putting out you know, the grandmasters of chess series. But there are certain names that are publicly known. There are a lot of chess movies. You know, there's some you know, very good chess movies. Uh, going off the Bobby Fischer thing, I was going to say, like, I don't know if this is exact metric, but you can look at results. Like, obviously, it's like, like tic-tac-toe or, you know, tournament. Like, you can't be dominant at it the way you could have, like, a Magnus Carlsen. Like, if someone is so dominant at a sport, clearly they're doing something no one else is. Sort of right, but, but is it a sport? Yes. Right. Right. And so this is the difference between a sport and a game. Yeah. Does there have to be a physical component to the game for us to call it a sport? Or we could also always just say we're concerning, we're dealing with physical sports. But even if chess is not classified as a sport, it does have a lot of statistics that can be useful for the more physical sports. And so one of the things talking about here is trying to figure out what is the value of a certain position and trying to come up with a way to evaluate this and get a sense of how does that translate into victory. And I shared with you a great article to read about this. We have the same thing in your know, football and soccer and hockey. You're trying to get what is the value of a given configuration. And this is one of the most difficult things to evaluate is how much is something worth? This is where the run expectancy matrix comes into play from baseball. We have so much data. We can look at these configurations and say, if you have first and third one out, this is with an average team against an average pitcher, how many runs we expect you to get from this position. For soccer, if you're shooting from this spot, 
This is how many times we expect out of 100 shots you to get a goal. Trying to figure out some way to evaluate the relative worth of the position. This is one of the hardest parts in writing any chess algorithm is to come up with a good way to assign values to things. And then you do different strategies. You know, I'm going to trade some materials, some pieces to get a better position on the board. So as to whether or not chess is a sport, um, to some extent, I hope so, because then my high school is a little bit more comparable to some of you. But in terms of it's definitely not a physical sport most of the time. Uh, quarterback passing rating in football. This was another interesting one. And one of the things is that it doesn't take into account a lot of times, you know, the quality of the teammates and opponents. You know, if you're playing a strong team or a weak team, you know, that's not really incorporated, just looking at your completion percentage. Now, again, a lot of times you can make more advanced statistics and the professional, you know, sports teams, they, they do all of this. Where you can take into account who you're playing. This one QBR about passer ratings. Right, I, I was talking about initially about just the passer rating. Uh, one of my favorite statistics is years ago, the Jets were playing the Bills and the Jets quarterback had a bad day. He was three for eight with two interceptions, at which point the Jets said, you're too bad to play for us, which is saying something. If you pretend that he was playing for the Bills, he goes from three for eight with two interceptions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He was two for eight with three interceptions. If you pretend he was playing for the Bills, he goes to three for eight with two interceptions. He actually had a better game if you pretended he played for the other team. It's very rare to have a day that bad. But it's also only eight data points. And so when you're trying to look for something like this, if you look at just the ratio, the ratio loses information about the number of attempts. And so when you're looking at you know, 20 for 22, that's the same as 10 for 11, which is almost the same as five for six. Which is more meaningful? Well, to do 20 for 22, that's far more meaningful because you've done that over a much larger period of time. So when you're trying to come up with statistics, you really want things that capture as much as possible. <coughs> and again, when you're calculating things by hand, so much of this is just, you know, you're not gonna be able to do this by hand, but with a computer, you can now call in all this information. So for those of you who know how to write script programs, we can really grab a lot of stuff. Before we start getting to these problems, I wanted to just spend the first week of the semester, especially as people are coming in and out of the class, before really delving into the mathematics, talking at the higher level of what we're gonna look at. And if you really spend the time thinking in the beginning, you will hopefully gather all the right data. One of my most influential papers in mathematics is I was looking at something that's called your zeros of elliptic curve L functions. And it was painful to gather the data, but because I had the data, I did a lot of different analyses. And one of them struck pay dirt. It found something that was very unexpected. And so we can look at a lot of different things as we pull down the data. We want to think, what do we want to look at? Which things really matter? That's the high level uh, takeaway I want you to get from all of this. Which statistics really matter? It's not just the percentage, it's percentage including some factor for the number of attempts. All right, uh, last one is a really fun one. Free throw percentages in basketball. This is probably one of the most easy statistics to discuss. So whoever sent this, thank you. Yeah, this makes my job really easy. Just, did it go in or not? Can anybody give me a situation where it might be a little bit more interesting than that? Yes. Good. You might be trying to get the rebound rather than just getting that extra basket. So you might actually have situations where you try to deliberately miss. This is similar maybe to how in baseball splits between walks and intentional walks. You know, you should get some credit for an intentional walk. They don't want to pitch to you, but is it because you're a good pitcher or they've got first base open and you know you don't really matter? And so again, the hope is that those are not that frequent, so they're not going to make a huge impact in the statistic, but there could be situations where you might want to deliberately miss. This is extremely easy to calculate. Uh, one of the things in sports that they often talk about is you know, the hot hand, clutch shooting, clutch hitting in baseball. 
you know, does this exist or not? And there's a lot of disputes as to whether or not it does or doesn't. That would be a great topic for people to discuss. The free throw is one of the most easily practicable things possible. The other thing I would like to do is I'd like to split the free throw similar to the clutch statistic that someone mentioned earlier. You know, how are you doing shooting free throws when it's a close game towards the end versus how are you when you're up by 10, <coughs> up by 20? And so again, for a lot of these statistics, you might want to look at refinements. And so I would think, I, I don't know, and again, you can check and see, have people broken down free throw percentages to free throw in pressure situations? A lot of times you have games that are going down to the wire. And those are the shots that really matter. All eyes are on you. The fans are really making a lot of noise. So I think that could be a fascinating statistic to look at. All right, so to end today, just want to put up just a few possible topics. Uh, these are some of um, the papers I've enjoyed over the years. One is you know, ranking college football teams. And I talked a little bit about this, but we've got some people who weren't here in the beginning. Football is, college football is terrible. Do I have any football players here? Okay, so uh, Williams is not allowed to play in bowl games, same as the Ivies where I went to. Otherwise, of course, you know, we would be part of the you know, conversations here. You don't have good teams, for the most part, playing each other from different conferences. So how do you judge how strong an SEC team is against a Big Ten team when they don't have common opponents or they don't have games against each other. And so there's a lot of you know, discussion about how do you come up with ways to rank. A lot of times it's, well, which statistics really matter? Do you want to give a team for piling it up and beating the shit out of a crappy team? Or do you say, look, once you've gotten a certain amount of lead, we understand you can have your way with them and do whatever you want and run up the score as much as you want. We're going we're gonna to cap the, you know, the benefit at this point call this a mercy kill. But there's a lot of great math about how do you try to rank you know, teams? And this is tremendously valuable. Why is this such an important question? Seating, Seating money, bowl games. Next one is modeling baseball games. So baseball outcomes as a high order Markov chain. So for a lot of things, you know, we have different game states. You know, say first and third, one out, and you have a batter come up. Well, we can write a baseball simulator. And you can say, maybe I have a 25% chance of getting a single, a 12.2% chance of getting a double, a 3% chance of getting a home run. Uh, maybe I have an 18% chance of getting into a double play, maybe a 5% chance of a sacrifice fly. And then you can simulate baseball games. And the hope is that by being able to simulate baseball games, we can then evaluate, well, how much is this player worth if I sign them to my team? I want to try to say, well, if I replace you know, so-and-so with this new person, what's going to be the change in my offensive production? And that will give me a way to try to evaluate how much they are. And so you can try to model baseball games. And of course, you could do more than just baseball games. Um, some other ones. You know, trying to build a predictive model for the NCAA tournament. The biggest problem here is trying to predict upsets, trying to take into account your know, teams coming from different conferences. How do you compare strengths of stuff like that? Similar to the baseball game, you know, the Monte Carlo, uh, but doing this in tennis rather than in baseball. And then the last one to just quickly mention is <laughs> game theory in tennis. So this is a wonderful paper we are, um, is there anybody who is not aware of how to play tennis? Okay, and I think we all agree that tennis is definitely a sport. And it can even be a team sport. So do you serve to someone's forehand or backhand? And so most people have a better forehand than backhand. So you might protect your backhand a little bit, which exposes your forehand a little bit. And so when you're then serving, well, do I serve to your forehand or your backhand? If I see someone is protecting their backhand too much, what will I do? Serve to the forehand very far down. So then if they start shifting back a little bit, this is very similar to baseball with the shifts. You know, at what point you know, does David Ortiz just bunt the ball down third? And are you happy if David Ortiz wants to bunt and not swing away? We'll give him first base. And so there's a lot of great game theory stuff that you can talk about, Nash equilibrium and something like this in terms of trying to figure out what is your strategy on where you serve? A lot of it is also the serve is just the beginning. 
if you serve someone deep in their backhand, they might be out of position for the next shot. So even if they return it, you might now be in a very favorable position for the next one. So again, these are just a couple of possible topics. Um, I want everybody within the next you know, two classes to choose something that they wanna work on and choose, you can work on it by yourself, you can work on it with multiple people. For the next class, I'll talk about a research project that I did this summer with a couple, I'm sorry, this winter with some students and uh, is available to be continued here, which could lead to conference presentations and publications. All right, so we will start the math in real detail on Friday. All right, so this is a good place to stop.